Well, praise God. Thank you guys for leading us in worship. Thank you for that, too. Well, no, Yeah, notes. Let me uh, just share just an announcement concerning the baptismal service that I didn't have the full information on earlier. Um, the baptismal service this afternoon will be at 1.30 at 3.15 East 46th Street in Garden City. So uh, take uh, Chendon East to... Um, to East 46th Street and then turn left all the way down to the last house on the right. And so that should be real easy to find. Just before the last house on the right. That should be real easy to find. Uh, bikes can park on concrete under the carport so you won't stick up in the dirt or whatever and fall over. So uh, thank you, Robert. So all three of the baptismal candidates today, uh, if you'll meet me at the close of the service, We'll uh, meet together for a minute, get a few things straightened out, and then uh, just have the clothes that you want to go in the water in, and a towel. And it would probably be good if you want to bring some loose sweats or something to throw over your wet clothes. And then that'll be, uh, make it work well for you. And uh, this is a real reprieve. All of you think, Robert, raise your hand, Robert. Because, uh, the water is always cold in the river, even in August or July. But it's even worse when it's not the water cold and you're getting out in 100 degrees, you know. Uh, you're getting out in 70 or something like that, then it makes it even worse. So uh, we don't usually try to go this late with baptismal services. However, with uh, Kirsten, we went to middle of October or the 9th of October one time. She was determined to get baptized. <laughs> Okay, so good. Appreciate getting that information to you so you can know what's going on. <clears throat> All right, this morning we're going to be in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Revelation 5, 1 through 10. But we're going to read uh, what we covered in the Tuesday night study. For those of you that were not with us, you can at least hear this read in context. It'll be chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. And then we'll pick up with verse 1 of chapter 5. He says, Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, we may mention the fact that there's not seven Holy Spirits in heaven. This refers to the fullness and completeness of the Spirit of God and the seven different characteristics of God that is listed in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 and this is uh, John's way of expressing this and before the throne there was something like a sea of glass like crystal and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind and we saw in our study that this is referring to all of the uh, major creation that God has created uh, the the four different things that are, are mentioned uh, the lion covering the king of the beast uh, the calf would be the domestic animals uh, the birds would be the eagle would be the one over the flying all the flying birds and then man as over all and so this is not some weird weird thing there but it's representative of the creation of God being before the throne of God uh, in heaven. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sat on the throne and will worship him who gives for, uh, for <clears throat> who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. Now, 
this is a representation of all that will be in heaven at that time as uh, as John sees this vision and it is representative of the Old Testament saints and of all the New Testament uh, saints and we have a representative number here which was 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament 12 apostles in the New Testament that makes 24 and they are the representation of the church that is before the throne of God now they uh, cry out saying worthy are you our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created now for our study today chapter 5 verse 1 he said I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals now we've already talked a a little bit last Sunday, a whole lot last Tuesday night, of the fact that the revelation, uh, at one moment, you'll be reading and looking at the characteristics of the one that's seated on the throne, and you get the idea that it's God. Yet, in another time, you read the characteristics and look into it a little deeper, and you get the idea that it's Jesus sitting on the throne. Now, this is not a contradiction in the Scriptures. Instead, it shows the unique oneness revealed in the Trinity. The teaching uh, that there is one God who has presented Himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, we see here the Father and Jesus are, are so uniquely one that the description of each one can take you back and forth if you really go behind the scenes and look at the descriptive characteristics. And if you just read it casually, you won't see that that much. But really going out and picking out what it's saying about each one on the throne, then you can get the idea, wow, is that Jesus on the throne? Or is it God on the throne? Or, 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 or what are we seeing here? And so I don't want you to be upset by that. I want you to be uh, convinced by that, that uh, truly the Trinity is a New Testament teaching and the Revelation reveals it really uh, just almost verse after verse. And uh, other portions of, of Scripture also reveal it. Uh, Don came to me after church last Sunday, or last Tuesday night, asked me a question about uh, the, the book of Genesis right in the beginning. Wasn't that verse chapter 1? Or Yeah. When, when he said, what is, this, what is this here when it says, let us create them in our image? Well, right out of Genesis. That's the Bible in the Old Testament teaching about the Trinity. He's talking about us creating them in our image. And so we have this Trinitarian teaching throughout Scripture. And, uh, and we see it really well uh, in uh, Revelation. So uh, take that as a good thing, not a bad thing, when you're seeing the differences here. Now, in this verse, it is crystal clear that it is God on the throne holding the book uh, in his right hand now it was written inside and on the back and it was sealed with seven seals now we know that it's God here and the reason is because of verses 5, 6 and 7 because there uh, Jesus is revealed as the one who takes uh, the book out of the right hand of the one that's on the throne so we see clearly this teaching then of, of what happens and the distinction between the two as John sees what's going on here. Now, as I said before, a casual reading of chapter 4 would leave us with saying, okay, this is God on the throne. A casual reading of chapter 5 would leave us with, well, this is talking about Jesus. But when you look at the specific details, the characteristics that are given in the different places in Scripture, then we see that the synonymous indications between them are, are there, they're legitimate, and they can clearly be understood and explained. Now, we'll see that uh, this seven-sealed book, and actually it would, would better be called a scroll for that day and time, but you can, most of your translations today is going to say book, but book or scroll. It contains then the secrets that are going to be revealed in the following chapters. So this is the, the first of the, the unveiling and the revealing 
of the things that are going to take just prior to and during the tribulation. Now, verse 2. It says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Now, here we just have uh, uh, this angel crying out and asking the question, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? There had to be someone that was going to be worthy to be able to break this book open and break each of the seals and let uh, John have the revelation then as to what each of these represented and what's going to happen uh, in the future. Now verse 3. He says, And no one in heaven or, or earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Now, here we see that it appears that there is simply no one worthy of opening this book and the seals. He, he's pretty clear here about there's no one on earth, there's no one in heaven, and there's no one under the earth. At this point, it seems that there's just no one uh, that John sees that is going to be able to step forward and have the worthiness and the authority to open this book. But then verse 4 says, then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. So, we see then that, that uh, this seeming news that there was just no one able to open the book and the seals and reveal the secrets that were going to be revealed in that, it caused John to start weeping. It was sad to him. And he's weeping uh, terribly here. And then this, uh, one of the elders... Uh, in verse 5 we'll see is going to approach him and say this and one of the elders said to me stop weeping behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals so finally we get to verse 5 here and shows us that there is one who is able to open the book now this one that's able to do this has a twofold description. First, he is the lion uh, that is from the tribe of Judah, is the one that the only one that is able to open the seal, the book and the seals. Now, the lion we already spoke about is in the animal kingdom is considered the king of uh, the king of the beast, and Judah in that time was considered the main ruling uh, of the of the twelve tribes of Judah. Uh, so it was ruling over Israel uh, at that time. Now, just this information alone would not give us enough uh, information to identify exactly who this person is. However, uh, as we go on in verse 6, uh, it speaks of a lamb as if slain. And so what we see in that is that this is talking about Jesus. It's calling Jesus the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And He is the one, the only one, that is able to open the seal. So here's another one of those times in which we don't have to guess what something means. If we will let the revelation uh, speak to us, it many times will explain exactly what's being said that when we first read it, it could be difficult and think, well, what can that mean? And, and so it's a good thought to always realize that uh, scripture is the best commentary on Scripture. Uh, and so if we can find what Scripture says to, uh, to tell us what's being said, then we're going to be a lot better off than just trying to figure it out on our own or following what some other person has figured out and says, I think this is what it means. Now, the second description is this. The one who's worthy to open the book and its seven seals is he is the root of David. Now, the root of David in this exact form is not in the Old Testament either. But Revelation 22.16, Jesus Himself refers to Himself as the root and descendant of David. So, uh, it is Jesus then who is, has been born in the lineage, in the line of David, that then is described here as the root of David and the one who's able to open the book and the seals. So, in all of this that John is seeing, there was no one in all the earth, on the earth, in heaven, or under the earth, 
that could reveal and open the book and the seven seals except Jesus. Jesus alone was worthy to open and reveal this message. <clears throat> now verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now John is able to see into the midst of the throne. And as he looks into the uh, area of the throne, he sees the four living creatures that we talked about in the previous verses that we studied last week. And uh, then the elders, and we know who the creatures and the elders are. And then in the midst of the throne, amidst the creatures and the elders, is a lamb standing as if slain. Now, without doubt or question, we know that's Jesus. John proclaimed when he saw Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The whole Old Testament system uh, was set up, the system of sacrifices and all, was set up to show that for sin to be dealt with, even just ceremonial sin in the Old Testament, for it to be dealt with, blood had to be shed. And when enough blood is shed, whatever is shedding the blood dies. And so that was the point that was wanting to be made by God. So that when the time was right, He could bring Jesus, the Lamb, He could bring Him on the scene and hopefully the people uh, from the Jewish uh, background and all would recognize, okay, this is that perfect Lamb that is going to be slain, shedding His blood on Calvary's cross, for man's sin. But unfortunately, most of the Jewish people didn't make that connection and uh, therefore did not accept Him as the Messiah. Yet we have the promise and the assurance that at the end of the tribulation period, that when Jesus comes again, there will be a remnant of Israel, still Jewish people, who will recognize Him as their Messiah and be saved. Now, prior to that, there are going to be many Jews that are going to be saved in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But uh, it, God has not turned His back on the Jews. He has not come to a place where He's not going to fulfill the promises that He made to them in the Old Testament. And the truth is this. He has promised the Jews a whole lot more than what they've got now. Uh, they have a little sliver of land. But in the... the uh, thousand year reign of Christ they will go back to every inch of the land that was promised them in the Old Testament and nobody will stop that from happening the Arabs the President of the United States nobody will ever lead them or push them to give up land again uh, saying you're going to have peace with the Arabs if you do Every time they've fallen for it, the Arabs have not given them one ounce apiece. They just get a little more land so they can just be a little rougher on them. And I want to tell you this right now. Anybody that is on the Palestinian side of this issue and against Israel needs to understand they're against God. Because God is on Israel's side. And that's not going to change. And so the President of the United States, the leaders of the world, whoever can start saying, oh, those poor Palestinians and all. But that's, it, they've got it twisted up. It's, it's Israel that's the people that are going to have the land and God's going to see to it. And it's going to be a rough time until they get it. But eventually at the end of the tribulation, it will all come back and they will be on that land uh, throughout the kingdom just it'll be theirs and they'll have the blessings that God promised them and intended for them to have so Jesus then becomes this lamb that shed his blood on the cross to cover our sins now one of the things that had to happen for a sacrificial animal to be acceptable in the Old Testament it had to be perfect you couldn't bring a blind one or a crippled one it had to be one that was perfect and that was showing us how that Jesus 
the Son of God, fully man, sinless. He had to be perfect. For if he had ever sinned, he would never have been able to be the Lamb that would remove our sins. Okay? So we get a lot of the teaching of the Old Testament makes a lot of the New Testament clearer to us and, and both are understood better when we put them together. Now, John describes Jesus as having seven horns. Now, in the Bible, horns are often used uh, for power. So, we're, we're seeing here just a descriptive way of John uh, seeing this vision and in a very uh, visionary way of God revealing this vision to, to be seeing Jesus with seven horns. In other words, the power and authority. In uh, Matthew 28, he said, uh, all power in, in and authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And so we see that power represented in these horns. Now, the seven eyes, we've seen the seven eyes before, and we've seen in Scripture that they are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, prior to this, we've not seen the seven spirits of God, the seven eyes, which is referring to the Holy Spirit. We have not seen the Holy Spirit and Jesus connected together as completely as we've seen the Father and Jesus. But now, we're seeing the other aspect of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that is now being connected very solidly uh, with Jesus. Now, these eyes speak of Jesus' ability to see and to know all things. And this is important. He is going to see and know all things. There is nothing that will have ever happened on this earth that will not be known by Him. So when it comes time for Jesus to judge, then He's going to be able uh, to judge uh, with all power and with all knowledge concerning everyone who has ever lived. Now, thus his judgment then will be just and fair because he will have all the necessary knowledge to judge correctly. And this is important for us to realize. Now, I'm going to share something with you now that uh, is a clarification that I was unable to make right at the close of the study Tuesday night. My mind had been going back and forth with so many things in, in terms of trying to keep sorted out what today's message and last Tuesday night's and the Sunday before that's and all. But uh, an important question was raised at the end and uh, I want to answer that now. We need to realize that it will be Jesus who will be seated on the throne in heaven during the time that the tribulation is going on here on earth. The the true Christians will have been raptured to heaven. And during that period of time, that seven-year period of time in heaven, one of the events that's going to happen is that the Christians will be judged. Now, the Christians will not be judged as to whether they their sins have been forgiven or not. That will have been taken care of when they were born again through faith in Christ. They're already in heaven when this judgment takes place. But clearly, it is a judgment of all believers to determine how have you lived your life after becoming a Christian. Have you been faithful or not faithful as a Christian? And this will determine rewards. And the rewards have to do with crowns. And the rewards have to do with how much responsibility will that person have ruling and reigning under Christ on the earth during the thousand year millennial kingdom. So it has to do with rewards. Now there's another judgment, and this is where the question was brought up that I'm able to clarify today and I wasn't uh, ready in mind to clarify it the other night. It's simply this. <clears throat> Many times we think in the Revelation chapter 20, the judgment of the great white throne, I think at least at one point in time, and maybe many of you still do, uh, think of the fact that that is the judgment of God. How many of you think that? Or have thought that? How many of you are not going to answer? <laughs> okay, uh, clearly it's not. Uh, John 5.22, God is saying this of Jesus. He has given all judgment to the Son. So it is Jesus who will be 
at the great white throne judging just like at the judgment seat of Christ because all judgment has been given by God to the Son. That's uh, uh, John 5, 22. Now, here we see the unity and oneness then of Jesus now connected more completely with the Holy Spirit. So we've seen now then the connection of Jesus and God, the connection now with God uh, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is the Lamb that was slain, but He operates, as we see here in this, He's going to be operating with these seven uh, spirits of God, uh, operating in the power then of the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways in terms of what He's able to see and know and identify. And again, we're just seeing the connection there of, of the two. Now, the seven spirits are the seven spirits of God. So in just these few verses, we have seen a connection clearly without the word Trinity or anything ever being used because that word is not in Scripture. And a lot of people will argue with you and say, well, the word Trinity is not in Scripture, so it can't be right. It can't be true. That's totally false. <clears throat> the word is not there, but... <clears throat> The description of what makes what we're calling the Trinity is there. And as we said earlier, it's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, it is in all kinds of places that many people read and don't pick up on. Just like the things we're seeing here in, in these verses. The Trinity is there if you'll read it deep enough and look at it and let the Bible speak and pick up on it. So, it is truly a doctrine that has been part of the Christian church since the mid uh, fourth century and it is absolutely a Christian doctrine and when you see <laughs> groups that call themselves Christians but actually come under the heading of cults you will you will notice that somewhere in that area is where they go wrong every time it's something about God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit they just fail there. So if if you know of anyone that is believing and teaching anything other than one God who has presented Himself as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all equally God, then they're in a cult. I don't care what their name is. It doesn't matter. Because you cannot, you can't get it wrong there and be right. Because when that happens, you're believing in a different Jesus and you're believing in a different Gospel. And Paul made it very clear in Galatians 1, if anyone, even an angel from heaven, brings you another Gospel, let them be accursed. Let them be damned is what it means. And he even repeats that. And so uh, this, is a, this is an extremely important uh, teaching in Scripture and it, 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 it's the dividing mark between those that are true and those that are false that claim to be Christians. It's one of those uh, major dividing areas. Now, what verse am I on? Are we ready for seven? Yes. Sure. Okay, so now John is able to see then in the midst of the throne. I've read six, right? Yes. Okay. He's able to see in the midst of the throne the living creatures, the elders, and the lamb standing who represents Jesus or in, in, in this scene. He describes Jesus then as having the seven heads and the seven horns. We've talked about that. Now, these eyes speak of Jesus' ability to see and to know all things. Now, when it comes time for Jesus to judge then he's going to have all that ability that he needs to make the right kind of judgment. So we see then that the, the oneness is continued here between Jesus uh, as, as God the Son, the Father as God the Father, and the Holy Spirit as God the Holy Spirit. And he is able then to work both in heaven and throughout the earth with the power that is represented, represented in all three. Never are they to be considered as three gods, but one. And it's very hard for us in our human understanding 
to understand that. And, and no one can do it justice of the Scripture's teaching, and I accept it by faith. Because no one can, can cause you and I to comprehend this, this subject. Okay? We will when we get to heaven. Now, I've shared this before. Some of you I know have never heard it. I hope it will be something that will help you. But there's a couple of things we can think about that gives us a slight <laughs> understanding. I'm one person. But I am a son to my mother, I am a father to my children, and I am a husband to my wife. I am the same one person, but I present myself in those different ways. Another is with something in nature. You can have water, okay, liquid, pour it out. Then below 32 degrees, it's solid, but it's water. It's ice. And then if you take it up to enough pressure and heat, it becomes steam, still water. So, here again, there's a couple of things that may help us comprehend how we can say it's one God, but He's presenting us in these other ways. Just like the one water or the one person being these different people. So if that helps you in any way, uh, good. If it doesn't, then you just need to let it rest and say, the Bible teaches it, I'm believing it, and that's it. Okay? Now verse 7. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, here we have Jesus the Lamb, who is operating, as we've already seen, uh, part of his power is operating by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he comes and he takes his book or scroll out of the right hand of God that's seated on the throne. And in verses 6 and 7, again we see this perfect harmony and oneness of the will of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's no wonder that Jehovah's Witnesses have to uh, write a different Bible. I don't know if you're knowledgeable of that or not, but the Jehovah's Witnesses have a different Bible than our Bible. Okay? They've translated it in their own doctrine and their own way. And so what they've done, they've gone into the scriptures and they've tried to replace uh, every place that teaches, you know, about the Trinity or that Jesus is God and all that. They try to replace all that with their, their theology. But the bottom line is, no, I've never read their Bible, but no doubt they've missed it in many ways. Because if they just change John 1, 3 and a few very overt passages like that, then they can change it and say, okay, now we, we can convince everybody that Jesus is not God. But what about ways like this in the Revelation? That's not overt. It's, it's very covert. It's very uh, solidly there. But you've got to have some go deeper to pull the meaning out. So, no doubt their Bible is still filled with the truth of the Trinity, even though they've rewritten it in places where it is so clear uh, to read it and say, okay, He was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, they can change those things. But they can't change the fact that Jesus is God. Now, we look at other groups that we would call a cult that would call themselves Christians. <clears throat> look at uh, look at the the set of the Mormons. Their their teaching is <clears throat> right in several different ways about things about Jesus. But what do they add? Well, when you get deeper into their teaching, you find out that they're teaching that Jesus is the spiritual brother of Satan, and they're teaching that Jesus is a God among many gods. And they're teaching that if someone will do it right and jump through all their hoops, they too will someday be a God over their own universe. And so they fit into the plan of what the Bible, what I mentioned earlier in Galatians 1. They have a different Jesus and a different gospel. Because they do not have a gospel that is by salvation, by grace, through faith in Jesus alone. No, in order to be right in their system, you've got to be baptized in their church. 
and, and all these other things and jump through all these hoops. And they baptize the dead. Yes, and they baptize the dead and all sorts of things. And so, you see, there can be groups that have a certain amount of truth and that pulls people in and they say they're believing and teaching a certain amount of the Bible and that pulls people in, but when you get down to it, they're not. Now, let's not leave anyone out this morning. What about the Roman Catholics? What about that? They're teaching, they have 1,500 years of the traditions of men, of popes and men and priests that they follow in their practices that are totally foreign to the teachings of the New Testament. And whenever something that they have in their uh, dogma or their doctrine or teachings contradicts the New Testament, what do they do? They take what is in the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And so, therefore, there, there are Catholics that are Christian. Okay? They've been born again through faith in Jesus. They get enough of the things about Jesus that somehow somebody could weave through all the mixture and become a Christian. That's absolutely possible. But it hinders most of the Catholics from coming to Christ because they place their faith in the fact that the church saves them. And if they take the Mass, it saves them. If they get the last rites, it saves them. And all these different things that are not biblical at all. And so, this is not to bash these groups, but it's to make us know that there are people out there who are claiming to be something that they're not. And most of the people that get hooked up with them are going to be carried into deception that will destroy their soul eternally. And that's why it's important to have people know who's what and who's teaching what and who's right and who's wrong. Now sometimes that's upsetting to people. They, they might not like to hear a preacher say things that I'm saying like this this morning. But think about all the preachers that have never spoken those things and all the people from their church that's gotten caught up in the Jehovah's Witness, the Catholics, or the Mormons. And you say, well, that surely would never happen. Huh, no way. The greatest growth in the Mormon church today is from people who've been in evangelical Christian churches that didn't know what the Bible had to say and they're pulled over into Mormonism. So every one of those preachers that was afraid to say the name of another group because somebody was going to say, oh, that's not nice of you you're not very Christian, then they are a part of having some of their people that was under their authority under God wind up in a cult. God willing, I will not be one of those people that let someone in our congregation do that. You're going to know and you're not going to read between the lines to guess what I'm trying to say. Like, who is he really talking about? I, I told you who I'm talking about, okay? And, and you can back it up with Scripture. And that's important for us to know, and it's important for us to, to keep those things in mind. Now, let, now that I'm on the Pope, or Catholics, <laughs> uh, uh, Kevin greeted me with something this morning that was very interesting. I didn't hear this, but in the Pope's travels here in, in the U.S., uh, I read a, an article that he pulled up and the Pope is wanting to become president of the world. He's wanting to become this world leader in which the church and ruling political people are drawn back together as it was during uh, the period of time of the, the, the church for about a thousand years in which the church and the, the Pope and the government were all one and the same. And so you can see this man right now 
He's on the forefront of bringing to pass and talking about the very things that are going to happen when the Antichrist shows up. A one world religion. A one world So, right now, we see all around us events that are happening that are showing us just how close we are to all of these things coming to pass. Now, there have been a lot of prophecies about this Pope. And uh, Mike was talking to me this morning about the fact of some things also that uh, this is the first Jesuit priest that's become a Pope. And uh, so there's a lot of significance it seems in that. But just keep watching until Jesus comes and gets us. And you're going to continue to see daily things happening and changing that is nothing in the world but confirmation we're getting closer and closer and closer to the return of Christ. Now, what is our attitude to be? The Bible says we're to look up because our redemption draws near. Amen. So we're not to be afraid. We're not to be worried. We're not to be fearful. We're to just say, just make sure that you're walking in relationship with God, looking for Him to come any minute, and you're going to be fine. It doesn't matter what else happens. If they throw you in jail, you're going to be able to endure it. If they have to take your head off, you're going to be able to endure it. I'm serious. I'm not joking. I'm serious. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Everyone born of God, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, everyone who has faith in Him in this fashion will, no question about it, will overcome. You will be faithful to the end. You will have the power, Kelly, of the Holy Spirit in you that will enable you to face whatever you may have to face before the rapture takes place. Now, we're not going to be in the tribulation, but there could be some difficult days for Christians in this nation before the actual tribulation comes. So, don't be surprised when it happens. But just simply know, it's covered if you have a true born-again experience with Jesus Christ. And that's the Bible. That's fact. And you can take it to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> okay, verse 8. I could talk to you some about some things that's going on in the banking system right now, but I won't chase that rabbit. <laughs> it, it, there's, some, there's some real serious things going on in the banking system. Right here in this valley even. And not just in one bank. But they got some stuff going that, that, that they're, they're running scared. Well, let me just tell you. <laughs> you already opened the can. You opened the can. Yeah. Kevin told me this the other day. Uh, he told me about a man that was trying to get $27,000, $60,000 out. $60, out of his bank account. And it was in his account. But he tried to get it out in one branch, and they would only give him a portion of it. He had to go to three different branches. 20. 20. 20. He can only get five grand at a time. Oh, five thousand at a time. Okay. All right. I misunderstood that. He had to go to all of the, all the branches everywhere of his bank to get his sixty thousand that was in the bank out. Okay. Now, let me tell you my experience. <laughs> yes, you know I've been trying to sell a motorcycle. Well, I sold it yesterday, and I got a check for it. And believe it came and picked me up, and it was on Key Bank. I didn't really know where there was a key bank, but we drove down uh, uh, Fairview, and there was a key bank, and it was open. So I went in, and I give them this check. The check was for $7,000, and it was on their bank, and I wanted to cash it. And the woman said, uh, well, there's a problem. Uh, and it wasn't that the money wasn't in the account. She said, uh, it's the weekend. And we only have a limited amount of money available. And therefore, we cannot cash the entire $7,000 check. I can give you $2,000 in cash, 
and I can give you a certified check for the other amount. Now get this. The doors of the bank are closing as I'm standing at the teller's desk. Uh, bar, counter. <coughs> that bank's going to open up Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Now, tell me this. When that bank opens its doors Monday morning, is that bank going to open and it don't even have $7,000 in it? I don't think so. I think that was nothing in the world but a lie, and I was just too nice a person to believe it. So, I get the $7,000. No, I mean, I get all of it. 2000 cash, the other part, and the check. Went straight down to my bank. My bank. Deposit that check, a certified check. Should be just like cash. And what does the person say? You can have $400 of this today. <laughs> you can have $400, $400 of this $5,000 almost you just put in the bank. You can have it today, but that's all you can have today. Now, I don't know what's going on, but I know the banks are doing it. And I know there's a lot of covering up and a lot of lying going on. And my thought is simply this. I think the banks are scared to death that people are starting to wise up to what's going on and they're going to be a run on the banks. You saw what happened in Greece. You could have a million dollars in the bank in Greece and you could get $66 a day, period. So, I'm just sharing that with you to say things are happening all around that are indicative of the things that are, 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 are going to happen and coming uh, at the end as we know is going to come. Now let me get back on the subject. I, I chased a rabbit on that. Watch all of you go take all your money out of the bank. <laughs> hey, go for it. Go for it if you want to. You know? Go to 20 banks if it takes to get it off. <laughs> do whatever you want to do. Because uh, uh, we're, we're living in a time we've never lived in before. Okay, verse 8. He says, When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, Jesus, or he, he takes the book here, uh, or the scroll, and this prompts the four living creatures and the, four, and the 24 elders to all fall down and worship Jesus. Now this is important. And this is probably one of the places that, that the Jehovah's Witnesses have missed it in their Bible. Uh, Revelation 22, 8 through 9, John hears and receives all this from the, from the angel, and John bows down before the angel to worship him. And the angel says to John, no, don't worship me, worship God. Now, what we have here then in Scripture is Jesus being worshipped. Right here in this vision, in the Revelation, and that simply proves His full divinity. You see it? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's undeniable. There is one God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but one God. And anybody that says anything less, they are absolutely 100% deceived and wrong. Now, so worship is received by Jesus, by God. Then if Jesus is worshiped, then Jesus is God. That's what we get from that. Now, let's close with verses 9 and 10. The 24 elders fell, will fall down before Him who sits on the throne and will worship Him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for You created all things and because of Your will they existed and were created. Now, one of the things that we've seen in our Tuesday night Bible studies. You already read that, Jim. Nine and ten. Jim, you're in the fifth chapter. 
Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Nine and ten, wrong one. Thank you. And, and, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and prayed from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. If you have made you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Thank you for straightening me out. I was reading nine and ten, the other one. Okay, so the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders, they sing this new song that's going to be sung in heaven. Now the 24 elders are representative of the church that's, that, that will be there. So, every born again Christian, someday, you're going to sing this song in heaven. Okay? <clears throat> so, they're singing this song, uh, a new song of praise to Jesus, uh, the Lamb who was and the only one uh, to be worshipped, and He was the only one able to break the seven seals and all of these things. So, this song is being sung to Him of his great worthiness. Now, he's worthy here in three ways. Because he was slain is the first. This, of course, refers to Jesus' death on the cross, shedding his blood for our sins at Calvary. Now, the important thing that's got to be understood is this. Jesus has dealt with sin, period. All sin has been dealt with. But, that does not mean every person's sin has been dealt with. We have to individually repent and come to Jesus in faith in Him to have our sins covered. All sin has been dealt with. But not every person will take advantage of what's been done. But every person that takes advantage of what's been done by coming to a true repentance and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation your sin is history. You said, but I sinned yesterday. Yes, and you just say, God, forgive me, and He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is not a, a legal thing to go out and say, hot dog, I can sin all I want to. Because if your desire is to sin all you want to and think you're going to get around it and, and not be uh, found guilty, then you don't have the Spirit of God. Your attitude would not be that way. And since your attitude as a true Christian is, I sin more than I want to sin, then that's evidence that it's right. Because we don't want to sin, but we still do. But the point is, sin has been covered. Now, uh, so each person then must accept Jesus for themselves. Now the second area of worthiness is because He purchased for God with His blood men from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. Now this shows us that some people from all the different people groups are going to be saved. But it also shows us something even more important as far as uh, for the world to realize. It shows us simply this, that Jesus is the only means for every tribe, people, nation, and tongue to be made right with God. You see, the idea is out there, okay, you speak such and such language, you grew up in such and such place, you have such and such religion, that's, that's good. The Pope is even saying it. We want to be tolerant of all religions. That's the move of the end. Because the truth is this. The Bible teaches that you can be such and such person with such and such language, with such and such religion other than faith in Jesus Christ and you can be as faithful and religious in the practice of that religion as anyone could be on earth and you're not right with God. When you die, you'll go to hell. Because the Bible is crystal clear. There is one and only one way to God and it is through Jesus Christ. And so every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every different group if they don't come to Jesus Christ, they're wrong. And they'll suffer for their own sins throughout all eternity. I mean, there are people that live, that their worship every day and their religious practice is feeding monkeys. There's every kind of strange, weird belief out there in the world. And there's all kinds of gods. But there's only one true God. And we can be made right with Him by His Son, 
Jesus Christ who died in our place for our sins. So, this is upsetting to the world. Oh, don't you say that you're the only way. I'm not saying that. I'm just repeating the Word. The Word. God's already said it. And every preacher of the Word of God needs to say it loud and clear. Because the church is not even getting it anymore. The church is even believing there are more ways than one. And it's because no one has stood up to say the truth. Now, verse th uh, the, the third thing of worthiness. Because He has made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign on earth. Those who are truly born again through faith in Christ are brought into the kingdom of God. And we're brought into the kingdom of God as priests. Now, the, the, the work of a priest is to represent man to God and represent God to man. And that's clearly what we as Christians on this earth are supposed to do. God has given us certain spiritual gift or gifts and certain uh, talents and abilities and a uh, certain time and, and all of these various things. And we are to be using that to be a priest representing God to man, man to God. It can be done in witnessing. It can be done in ministry. It can be done in prayer. It can be done in whatever area of gifting that you have. But we as born-again Christians are priests in the kingdom of God. And we're already priests in the kingdom of God. We're not saying someday I'm going to be a priest in the kingdom of God. We're not saying someday I'm going to be in heaven. The Bible says that we already are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's how completely it's already done. We're already a priest. Amen. We're already, as far as God's concerned, in heaven. Victorious. And we have been since Jesus was raised from the grave. Hallelujah. Those who have been faith in Him and followed Him in water baptism, the, the analogy carries forth there that you have been already raised from the dead Amen. with Him. Crucified in Christ. Exactly. I mean, we got a lot here. We got a lot to look forward to. But we got a lot already that we don't even know we've got. That the Bible is telling us, hey, you as a Christian are a whole lot better off than what you think. That's right. That's Every right. one of us are. And, and, and the Bible reveals that. Now, i got to close. <laughs> so, the faithful Christian then will be given a position of responsibility ruling and reigning under Christ who rules the whole earth during the thousand year millennial reign. Now, this, as we said earlier, will be determined by the Christian as to how they live the Christian life. But the main important thing is this, and I close. You have to first accept Christ. And He has to be the sole means of your forgiveness. That gives you eternal life, forgiveness of sin, and that gives you your place in heaven. But once you've done that, we're changed. And now, as Christians, we're start, supposed to start to live for God. And so we need to begin to do the good Christian works that the Bible talk, talks about. Not to get saved, but because we are saved. Okay? We're to live, as we saw the other day, lives of holiness like Him. We're to use our time, our talents, our money, our spiritual gift to serve Him faithfully. We are to follow Him as a believer in water baptism. All of those things that we've been saying for weeks. It, we're to do it now because we've been saved by grace through faith. So, if you're here today and you have any kind of a decision that the Spirit of God is leading you to make, then I want you to do so. The prayer team will be at the back at the close of the service. They will pray with you. Go back and tell them, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm here. I'm making this decision. I want you to pray with me in this fashion. And they will pray with you. Our offering bucket is here to my left. If you'd like to participate in this ministry, then drop in your tithes and offerings. Now, hopefully you're planning to go to the, to the uh, baptismal service. Bat people being baptized be there at 15 after everyone else at 1.30. At 315 East 46th Street, Garden City. Take Chinden East, uh, East 46, turn left. Go all the way down to the last house on the right, uh, and it's uh, across from an empty field. 
just before. You'll, you can find it easy. We'll be there. Okay? God bless you. Thank you for being here.